morning. I'd like to welcome everybody to Exit Issues today. My name is Jada Breeden. I'm with the Guymon Chamber of Commerce. And I always forget to tell you that, so hopefully you've always known throughout this whole year that that's my name and that's where I work. But uh, today's Exit Issues is sponsored by Seaboard Foods, so if you can please give them a hearty thank you, that'd be great. We have a good crowd here today, and I know that there are lots of things to talk about, so we're just going to go ahead and get started. Uh, with us today is Representative Casey Murdoch, and he is here and ready to tell you stuff. I'll let him elaborate, and what we do, if you haven't been here before, we uh, allow him to do uh, his presentation and then I'll bring around the microphone and whenever you would like to ask a question, please raise your hand because we may hear you in the room, but TV land can't. So we'd like to have what you're asking on um, air, I guess. So anyway, without anything further, I'm gonna let Mr. Murdoch take over. Thank you. Thank you, Jada. Thank you all for coming. Uh, Wow, this, this session has been horrible. Uh, I've talked, you know, I, this is my third year and I've talked to uh, several people that down there that's been there for 12 years and, and they said that this, this has been the worst session they'd ever seen. Uh, you know, last year we had a $1.3 billion hole in the budget and that was bad enough, but we, Last year, we filled the budget with low-hanging fruit, uh, you know, the, the easy stuff to, to pick and, and, and fill the budget. We walked in this year with a billion-dollar hole in the budget, uh, but we'd already taken all the easy stuff last year, and so this year we had to uh, make some tough decisions. And I, I, on the way over here this morning, I was thinking about what I was going to say, and I remembered last year. Uh, at this time, when I was given the session uh, recap, I think I made the, the comment that I had to make some votes that made me sick to my stomach. Uh, this year, I had to make some votes I didn't like to make. But uh, when, when the, options, uh, the options that we had on the table this year wasn't good, wasn't good, was not good for District 61 uh, if we didn't make some tough decisions. Um, I will, I'll tell you where we were when I walked into session at day one, we were, we were looking at 26% cuts across the board to every agency. That's what it was going to take to fill this hole. I mean, if we just did nothing, it was going to be 26% cuts. The cuts that we have made to our agencies over the past five or six years they couldn't, they couldn't deal with those 26% cuts. So we started day one working on, on getting these cuts down. Uh, three weeks ago, we were at 15% cuts. Uh, to me, that's, that's not good. The, the AB chair brought the budget at that time to me and, and she showed me two things on there that I did not like. Uh, the extension office get no funding this year if we did not fix some stuff. Uh, that's our 4-H program. Uh, you know, the, in Cimarron County, they have just got their extension office to open back up three years ago. Um, most definitely that would be one of the first ones they closed down. Uh, that concerned me. Conservation districts would have been cut dramatically now, with the conservation districts, they get federal matching funds. So, uh, actually this year, at the end of the day, they actually got some money. And uh, they were able to get the federal matching funds uh, for, their, for their dam project. So, that was a win. But that's where we were at moving in. So, so our budget this year is $6.9 million, or billion dollars, sorry, uh, appropriated budget. We had to backfill $878 million. But when you add in the incentives and, and just basically the, the daily bills we had, that, that puts us at about a $1.1 billion 
uh, hole in the budget total of what, what our responsibilities are that we backfilled, but we were able to hold 15 core agencies harmless, held them flat. And the average cuts to the other agencies was about 4.2%. Uh, that's not great when you add it into the cuts that we've made last year and the year before and, and, and before I got there. Uh, it's, in, in my belief, we've, we've cut our agencies to the bone. I mean, there's, there's no more cuts. And, and this session was, was very hard because I would get emails and phone calls that we need to cut fat out of the government. Since I've been there, we've cut close to a billion dollars um, out of these agencies. I mean, we've, we've cut a lot, of, a, a lot of fat out of, our, out of our government, and I think we've cut well enough, but can we do better? Yes, we can. Uh, one thing that uh, probably the bill that I was most excited about of mine was uh, House Bill 1690, and what that was, that was uh, an audit bill and it would do forensic audits on the top 20 agencies. And uh, I'd modeled it after Ohio, and I've talked quite a bit about this bill. I was excited about this bill. But Ohio, since they started doing that, had saved $98 million. And it's these forensics, for forensic audits, they would look at do programs overlap. Uh, it's more in efficiencies. And they were able to find cost-saving measures without cuts, but just can we do things better? Can we do things more efficient? And I think we can as a state. Well, my bill got married to the, the Speaker of the House bill and the pro tem of the Senate's bill. And they took, there were actually three audit bills this year, and they took a little bit out of each audit bill and married them into one bill. And that passed the House floor and the governor signed it. So we are trying to get the train back on the track it's a slow process, but uh, I'm excited about that bill. So we have imp implemented $578 million of reoccurring revenue for the state. Now, like I said, last year we filled that $1.3 billion hole with low-hanging fruit. That low-hanging fruit was we swept, uh, and, and I, I, I like to tell you, when I say we, I say it as a collective. I'm, I'm not saying that I agreed with what we did, but I'm just saying as, as the legislator, as a collective, we either swept uh, revolving funds from different uh, agencies, or we grabbed one-time money, and with the oil <coughs> prices where they're at, this year, we had to look at reincurring revenue. We could not fix our problems with one-time monies. We have to look at reincurring revenue, and that's what we did this year. And we, we passed uh, enough revenue raising measures that it's $578 million worth of reoccurring revenue this year. That should help us with next year's budget. And that's what we've got to look at is what is coming next year. Um, I'm hoping that oil will rebound, and like it or not, oil is, is the main driver of our, our economy in Oklahoma, and when oil hurts, the whole state hurts. And it's not the Devons and the Chesapeake's and the Continentals, it's those service companies. It's j &L Trucking and Shattuck, it's the service companies in Woodward. If uh, they're not out there servicing these wells, they're laying people off and they're not paying their income tax because they don't have a job. They're not out buying furniture, buying food. They're moving to another state, getting another job. And that that's, has snowballed into the effect of why, why our economy right now, why our state budget is, is so bad. But I think we have addressed a few things this year that, that will help. Uh, we did have a slight increase in appropriations for common education. And we maintain funding for ODOT's eight-year plan. 
and we also funded the DHS Pinnacle Plan fully. So, like I said, when we started this session with looking at 26% cuts and even three weeks ago at 15% cuts, these programs were at risk. And, and I, feel, I feel very good about being able to keep these 15 core agencies held harmless. Um, and I talked a lot at the first session that we were going to get a pay raise for the teachers. Uh, on the House side, we worked real hard. And back as a collective, and I've got to give Representative Mike Rogers all the credit. He worked his tail off trying to get a teacher pay raise. Uh, he had a, a plan to, to, over three years, give the teachers a $6,000 pay raise. Uh, it was doable. Uh, we ran three different measures on the House floor to fund it, and we, didn't get, we did not get the 76 votes for those revenue raising measures to fund the teacher pay raise. Um, it got held up, Mike Rogers' plan, Representative Rogers' plan got held up in the Senate. And what that was, what his plan was, was $1,000 this year, 2000 next year, and at the third year, a $3,000 raise to, in three years, give a 6000 Teachers would have a $6,000 pay raise. <coughs> we had several members of the House willing to go to the mat for the teachers. They were willing to go to a special session uh, trying to force the Senate to do the teacher pay raise. Special session is not a good thing. No one wins in a special session. If we would have went to special session, all the work that we have done this session would have started over. These, where we got the, the budget to a 4.2% average cut for the agencies other than the ones we held harmless, that's back on the table. Uh, so the group that was willing to do that we visited with them and said it can get a lot worse if we go to special session. And so they decided to, to go ahead and vote for the budget and, and get out. And we did get a promise from the Senate that that will be first on the list next year to work on is, is the teacher pay raise. Um, we did fund fully fund the teachers flex benefits this year. We're able to do that. And so the increase for, for common ed last year, FY17, uh, we appropriated $2.4 billion to common ed. This year, FY18, we appropriated 2.4 Well, it's it's two billion four hundred forty-eight million dollars with, so it comes out to about a thirty-eight million dollar <coughs> increase to education. So, with a year like this year, and I was I was worried uh, because a lot of uh, rhetoric at the Capitol was consolidating schools, was consolidating administrations. I'm I'm not a fan of that. Uh, because uh, they're going to look out here first. Uh, they're going to look at Western Oklahoma. And I've preached since I've been here, we've consolidated all we cons consolidate, can consolidate logistically out here. We've done it. Uh, since I've been in office, we've lost one school out here. Uh, Gage School has consolidated with Fargo. Uh, that, was, that was horrible. Uh, as, as you guys well, are well aware, Whenever a community loses a school, they lose the whole community. The community dies. And that's why I fight so hard for these small schools, because you lose a whole community. You lose the identity of that community when that school closes. And Gage, that was, that was tough. I, I fielded a lot of phone calls from people from Gage that was upset over that. And I did not want to see that happen. Uh, and even three weeks ago when we were at a 15% cut or what we were looking at, that's what was foremost in my mind. 
we did a lot of education policy work, and I will have this in my next uh, column, everything we've done. I mean, it's, we've done a lot. Uh, some of the big things, <coughs> probably the biggest, what I think, is uh, because, you know, we've, we've been losing teachers uh, to Texas and Kansas and other states because of what we're paying teachers. And one thing we did, uh, we took the $18,000 pay cap off of retired teachers that's wanting to come back and teach after retirement. And we gave it up to the school board. School board and pay them what they want. There's not a, there's not a cap on paying a retired teacher that wants to come back. <coughs> so on energy, so one thing I'm excited about, uh, we passed right in the last week a long lateral bill. Uh, a multi-unit bill. This should help our state budget, should help Oklahoma's economy. Uh, this year and this year's budget, just by doing this, what it's going to bring into the uh, state budget is $19 million. Next year it should bring in about $100 million. In District 61, I think it's this long lateral will really help our district and, and help our mineral owners. It will allow mineral owners to be able to draw out the minerals underneath their property more efficiently and get them all. So the last month of, of session, and I'm sure you heard, we've had lots of fights down there about GPTs, gross production tax. Um, it, it got to the point it was almost ugly, the fight in between where, what we're going to do with gross production tax. Um, a lot of people wanted seven. Uh, the industry came, they, they, when they were in the budget deals, and, and this is second hand, I was not in the room when the budget deals happened, but the House and the Senate would go four. Uh, Leader Inman wanted five, and that's where they butted heads. There, there was no movement either direction. And what upset me is at this time we're looking at the 15% cuts. I'm worried about 15% cuts for our district. The difference between 4%, raising it to 4% and 5% was about $9 million. Nine or $18 million. In our budget, that's, that's nothing, and I, I do not understand why there was no give there. Uh, but there was not any give on, on that. They, they, they both sides bulled up, and, and uh, Leader Inman wanted five. Uh, the Speaker of the House and the Speaker Pro Tem was held on four, and there was, there was not any give. Uh, but what we did do is, and I learned a lot uh, this year, uh, I thought there was 2% wells and there were 7% wells. So horizontal, what Oklahoma did, and I believe it was in 1996, gave an incentive, and I'm a big incentive guy. I, I, I look at a, of incentives like fertilizing your crop. Uh, you gotta put a little fertilizer out there to grow a crop. <coughs> These incentives is, is a little fertilizer to get companies to come to Oklahoma, to give them an, an, an incentive to invest in Oklahoma. Uh, and so in 96, I believe, we gave the incentive for these oil companies to do uh, long laterals, horizontal drilling. And uh, it was a new technology in 1996, and uh, that incentive was, I think, uh, a good way to go. We're in 2017. Uh, horizontal drilling is is the way oil is is done today. It's it's not a new uh, technology. It's it's kind of the mainstay. I they they don't need that incentive in, in my in my opinion any longer. Um, so what we did what there was, there was 1%, and if you remember, I think it was in 2012 or 14, they went from, they jumped it from 1% to 2% on, on the horizontal wells. 
So we had around 5,5200 wells out there that was still on the 1% uh, GPTs. And what we did this year, we raised that to 4%. And uh, that, brought in, that brought into this budget about $95 million. So there's no more uh, 1% wells out there. We jumped that up to 4%. And why we could do that, where, where the hang up is, uh, when we were battling over the four and five percent, that was going to be an actual tax increase. And for us to increase taxes at the legislature, it takes 76 votes. With the Democrats locked up and will, they did not vote for any revenue raising measures at all this year. Uh, they locked up we had to put our budget together with 51 votes. So by taking these incentives away, that's a 51 vote to take an incentive away. And so that's what we did. We raised it from one to four. We also removed uh, the, the exemptions and rebates that oil and gas gets, and that brought in about $49 million to the budget. <clears throat> the real ID we passed first week of session. Uh, I know I talked about it, I think our first eggs and issues. Uh, real ID was uh, to get us federally compliant with, with our ID uh, so that you all can go get on an airplane. You can get into a military base. Uh, I know in January, February, Amarillo Airport had a sign up that said if you're from Oklahoma, if you don't, you're not going to be able to get on an airplane that past this date. And we've been getting over the years uh, extensions to get this done and, and uh, from the federal government, and we finally got that done this year. Uh, one thing I'm not proud of, and I fought very, very hard on, on this one, was uh, we did take $500 million away from wind in, in the zero emission tax credits. That cost us projects out here. Uh, I got a phone call from a gentleman from Balco that was very unhappy. Uh, the company was going to come in and put wind on him, and they called him up and canceled all their contracts. They moved to Texas. He was unhappy because he was counting on that to retire. <coughs> that was his retirement plan. Um, I, I probably burned up a lot of a lot of political capital on that one. Uh, the speaker and I had very very hard words with each other on on that bill right there. Um, I'm still unhappy over that one, but that is one thing we did was, and that 500 million is over 10 years, so it would save the state 50 million dollars a year in in the incentives. I think wind brings that back. I know it brings that much back to our community, our district. And that's kind of the highlights. Of, of what happened, uh, I'll, I'll open it up for questions now. Okay, who's first? Okay, good thing we're standing right there. Yeah, right. Um, Josh Setzer, guy in Oklahoma. Okay, so um, you said that the fight over the gross production tax from 4% to 5% was only going to bring in $9 million? The difference between going four and uh, and uh, five. And I could be wrong, it could be 18. It's nine or 18 million, but either way, when you're looking at a $6.9 billion budget, nine or $18 million is not, I don't think that's a sword to die on. Well, I think it was, this, the numbers are way off, I think, because it was a significant increase, the 1% increase, but I have to stand up for Representative Scott Inman because when you were talking about revenue raising bills from this last session, the biggest 
motivator behind generating revenue would be the gross production tax in Oklahoma, especially when oil and gas isn't necessarily paying the quote unquote fair share that they should be paying. They pay a less of a percentage than any teacher in Oklahoma does as far as taxes go. So um, I just don't understand why that wasn't fought for more this last session. <coughs> I was agreeing with you till you said you was going to stand up for Inman. Uh, well, he's fought f hard for he, regular Oklahomans. He uh, he's fought hard against the oil and gas industry. He uh, I'm I'm not going to get in a debate with about Scott Inman. I'll I'll tell you what happened on the floor, and and my perspective. Uh, Scott Inman was not the only one on that floor that wanted seven there were 25 Republicans that wanted seven. Um, the Senate would not hear a 7% gross production increase. Um, so the House was not going to send it over there for it just to die. Um, in conversations that, that we had with oil and gas, and I say that so you need to take it for what it's worth, but in, in when we're negotiating with them, uh, they said at 4%, they can pay 4%, you go up above that, they're gonna be drilling somewhere else. And uh, I'm just reiterating what they said. Uh, I, uh, I'm, I'm with you that I think that oil and gas can step up to the plate and, and uh, help with the budget a little more. They did help this year with about $150 million to this budget, uh, but I'm still a big wind guy. Wind helped with $500 million this year. Uh, last year they helped with, I don't know the number, but we took incentives away from them last year and the year before. Uh, in bad times, everybody's got to come up and, and, and help out. So earlier you were talking about how Democrats didn't vote for any revenue raising mm -hmm. bills. When you're talking about revenue raising bills, that's usually raising taxes, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm, isn't that backwards? Republicans it's totally wanting backwards. to raise taxes it's, and Democrats it's, wanting to lower So So it, it's totally backwards. You're, you're exactly right. Okay. Uh, so this year we was looking at 1.1 billion dollars we had to fill. You know, I, I talked about the cuts we were going to have. We've already cut everything. We took all the low-hanging fruit. We had no choice this year. We had to raise revenue somehow, some way. And I don't know how many of y'all really followed what happened on the floor. But when we finished our committee work and we started hearing bills on the floor, every question that the Democrats asked was, is this a revenue generating bill? Does this bill help our budget? This was, we were running policy bills. No, it, I mean, it was policy bills. It had nothing to do with revenue. But they asked that question. <clears throat> every bill, they asked that question. When we got up to the revenue raising bills, they voted no on them. And they were, you are correct, Scott Inman fought hard, hard, hard for seven, seven percent. And uh, they were going to vote against any revenue raising measure unless he got seven percent. Now, seven percent raising oil and gas GPT to seven percent was not going to fill the $1.1 billion hole. Now, it's one piece of the puzzle to fill it, but we had to have these other pieces to fill $1.1 billion. And every time we voted on a revenue raising bill, which takes 76 votes, we had to have Democrats vote for it. Every time one of these other pieces of the puzzle went down, got voted down, that made our cuts go up. <clears throat> that piece of the puzzle fell away. We didn't have that revenue coming in. and that GPT at 7% was not going to fix our budget. 
It would have helped. It would have helped. And if we would have went to 7%, we might not have looked at 4% cuts on the other agencies. We might have been able to hold everything flat. Now, I don't know, I'm, I'm not the AB chair, I, I, I don't know how that would have fit into the puzzle, but it would have helped. Well, years ago when we had a balanced budget, the GPT was at 7%, and since then it's been decreased and we've had a hole in the budget, so it just seems like common sense that if we went back to 7%, we'd be fine. But what makes me sick to my stomach is that everyone downstate at the Capitol talks about sitting down with oil and gas to negotiate. When the hell did we vote for oil and gas to have a representation at our capital? You're, you're exactly right. So why do we ever uh, do negotiate we, with them? I, I, I'm not going to argue a bit. And when they threaten to pull out of Oklahoma, why don't we call their bluff? Because they're not going to. The oil no. isn't going anywhere. We're sitting No, it's on top not. You're, you're exactly right. It's not going and anywhere. And if they want to leave, that leaves some other local oil drilling companies to mm -hmm. actually do business in Oklahoma instead of having Texas companies come in here and rape our land. Yeah. You're right to a point, but uh, with the big fines that they found around uh, in Texas uh, and in North Dakota, what they can do is they lay those rigs down here and go down there and start drilling, and our economy's in the, in in the toilet. We've got it. We've got to fix it today. We got to fix it last week. Uh, we couldn't. We couldn't handle that. And it's it's a it's a waiting game. So they can move down there. And I I was told uh, I wasn't at the meeting, but they had a, a conference, uh, a panel, and the CEO of Devon and the CEO of Chesapeake were were speaking on this panel, and, and they were asked, you know, uh, does does the rate that the state tax you does that make a difference on where you drill? And they said, no, it really doesn't. It's regulations. And Texas GPT is higher than ours, and they're still drilling in Texas, and it's because of their regulations in Texas. And they look more at regulations than taxes. Now, I'm, I'm kind of firming up your argument there, that these companies are looking at regulations more than taxes. And I've, I've uh, been for raising GPT all year long, so I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm in your camp there. I've actually kind of got beat up pretty bad about that. Uh, but anyway. <laughs> All right. Uh, my question is con oh. Patrick Coble. My question is concerning, um, I guess, because like I work for the school here in Guymon, and uh, while common education did stay pretty flat, uh, and it stayed flat last year, because we continue to keep having revenue failures mm -hmm. starting in january our superintendent's like okay well you're getting a hundred thousand dollars less this this month than you were supposed to because mm -hmm. the money's not there so is anything being done to i guess not necessarily find new sources of revenue as much as create new avenues of revenue because like we chase wind out of the state we've seen to it that we can't expand in other areas of business and if this is a situation of you know, in the case of the wind, I know that the person who pushed it the most was the speaker. So is there anything that's maybe being done to, I don't know, get better leadership in the House and the Senate to where we can, act, you know, at least expand our, maybe not necessarily have an immediate impact, but expand our future revenue projections because we've got more businesses doing business in Oklahoma? I, I agree with you. Uh, as far as uh, the last couple of years, we, we have had a revenue mm -hmm. failure that hits February, first part of the year, we have went back in and refilled that. Mm -hmm. But you are, I mean, it's, it's, you're having a hard time paying the light bill in February until we refill that, but we have refilled that. As far as the wind battle in, in Oklahoma, and as you all are aware, i have the number one promoter of wind in this state, uh, we're gaining ground. Uh, last summer, Harold Ham spent, I have no idea how much money he spent on advertising on television and billboards in Oklahoma City and Tulsa. More money than we'll ever see. Uh, that changed the conversation in Tulsa and Oklahoma City. I got on a plane at some point this year, and I sat by a guy that was from uh, Guthrie. 
and we were talking and, and he's just sitting there bashing wind. And his talking points is what he heard on that television advertising. Uh, most people out there are, are, are not like you. They, they are not politically motivated and they, they, they pay attention to what's going on. They, they see a 30 second ad on TV and think that's gospel. And last summer, Harold Hamm pushed millions of dollars in ad campaigns against wind. This year I've visited with the Wind Coalition. They are going to put a lot of money in Oklahoma in ads to change uh, people's mind. They're going to push a lot of money in Oklahoma in ads. Uh, back to your question on leadership. Um, like I said, the speaker and I had pretty hard words. I, I guess you could s about as hard as words as you can ever tell a man, him and I had those words. And uh, we had, we've got actually in, in our caucus, we have four members from the eastern side of the state, from Tulsa. And I don't know what it is about Tulsa. They don't like us out here. They, they think we get too much. They don't think we ought to have anything out here. But these four members from that Tulsa area are the ones that stand up and say, we need to t go after wind. We need, to, why don't we do this? Why aren't we doing more against wind? Uh, the last time that was said, I went up to the speaker and I said, Mr. Speaker, I, I'm, I've, I've fought every day in, in caucus on this. I said, I'm, I'm, I'm tired of this. I'm just gonna talk to you directly. The speaker said after the, we took the $500 million, he said, we're done with wind. We are not attacking wind anymore. This is it. And the last time I talked to the speaker, I said, Mr. Speaker, I'm not gonna get up in caucus and I'm not gonna argue uh, and, and have a, a fight and waste time. I'm just gonna come talk to you. I said, I guess, you know, I'm gonna remind you what you said, that we're done with wind and I guess I'll be your conscience on your shoulder whispering into your ear. And he did come to me at the end of session, sat down and goes, all the, all the anti-wind bills are dead this session. Now, that's this session. They're gonna come after us again next year. Uh, there, Harold Hamm is not gonna stop until every windmill's plucked out of the ground or he's put into it. Um, it's just gonna be ongoing. And I don't know what it takes to blow $15 billion. I'd like to find out someday, but as long as he's worth $15 billion, he's gonna to continue to fight it. Cy Perkins from Gaiman. When you talk about taking 500 million from uh, wind, is that promised incentives that we're reneging on? Yes. In other yes. words, we we told them they'd have this for a period. And now we're saying who changed their mind? We I I tell you what, the, since I've been down there at the at the Capitol, we look like Guatemala. Uh, to outside bankers, to outside investors, we look like Guatemala. I mean, you can come make a deal with us, but tomorrow you may not have it. Uh, last year the AB chairman, Earl Sears, Representative Sears, made a deal with Wynn, if, if you did this, we'll leave you alone. Four months later, he's reneging on that deal. Four months. Uh, Wynn companies have a bad taste in their mouth for Oklahoma right now. I have visited in-depthly with the speaker about changing that. I said, let's put this behind us. Let's start re-imaging ourselves and inviting them in. Uh, and it's not, it's not just wind. Wind is not going down to the first national bank on the corner and borrowing the money. They get their money from New York, Boston. I mean, banks that loan out billions of dollars for these investments. Now, I'm just a small guy, but one time in my life, I, I got into a bad deal. I kind of got messed around on a, on a pasture lease. The next year, I go back to my banker to borrow money and my banker said, if you go back to that deal, I'm not loaning you money. Now, how many bankers in New York and, and Boston is going to say, if you go back to Oklahoma, we're not going to loan you money? Or 
you have another industry that wants to come to Oklahoma. And they go to their banker and says, hey, we're going to build this factory in Oklahoma. And that banker's already been burned once. He goes, I don't know if you want to do that. You might ought to look somewhere else. This $500 million deal we did to them, Enid, was going, they were second on the list for a, a blade manufacturer facility. Second on the list to be chosen to build this facility in Enid. Thousand jobs. Because of this $500 million deal, that company backed out of Oklahoma. This is, this is bad policy. And I've, I've said this several times, it's kind of like you, you own a restaurant and things are tight. Yes, things are tight in Oklahoma. But do you close your rest down, restaurant down at noon, shut the doors, or do you open them up and, and say, I want more business? And we have got, in Oklahoma, and we've had it since statehood, all our eggs are in oil and gas. That's all our eggs are in one basket. And when oil and gas is hurting, the whole state's hurting and we need to diversify our economy. We need other things that we can rely on than just oil and gas. Leon, you, you plant uh, maize and wheat, and you have cattle. You're diversified. That helps you. If, if wheat's not worth anything, cattle's worth something. We've gotta look at that as our state. We gotta diversify. When oil is not good, we need wind to be here. You know, Bowen's coming in. That helps, but uh, you know, I, I look out towards the future, and what I see wind in our future for Oklahoma is not just the energy we're producing, it's, it's the companies that we're attracting to come here. And these companies are wanting clean energy. They're wanting renewable energy. Uh, you know, you go to McDonald's and you look on the side of that cup and they got those, those three arrows in a triangle. They use that as a marketing toy, a, a marketing tool. We have the best wind in the world right here in the Panhandle, and we need to market it. We need to sell it. Iowa is turning into the little, little Silicon Valley of the United States because of wind. These tech companies are moving to Iowa. I'd as soon have moved to Oklahoma. That's high paying jobs, good jobs. Jade is getting her exercise today. I need it, but I, I would want to wear better clothing for that. Hi, Richard Kroos, Guyman. Uh, mine is more of a statement. In your uh, discussion about the budget and everything, it was kind of implied that the Democratic Party was almost stonewalling any kind of Not implied, it, that, that happened. Well, as far as like the gross production tax, the Democratic Party actually wanted 7%. And for people who don't understand this, Oklahoma has the lowest gross production tax of any state in the United States for oil and gas. What we actually need to help our budget is 10%, which would still make us the lowest gross production tax in the United States. I think the next one, or, or actually maybe the second, I think the lowest, second lowest is nine something. It's Texas is 5.3, uh, North Dakota is around 10 or 11. Uh, right. Those are the numbers I know right off the top so, of my head. So, exactly. So, like I said, what we actually need is 10%. They wanted 7%, so they were willing to compromise. They even came down to 5%. So the Democratic Party was more than willing to compromise. The, the Republican Party would not budge one inch. Uh, many of the uh, Republican Party members, and primarily the Senate, have been literally bought by oil and gas. Uh, Representative Marlotte is the second largest lobbyist donation receiver from oil and gas in Oklahoma. So I just wanted to understood that you know what the reason the Democrats were uh, blocking this is many of the revenue raising things would have hurt poor people. We were trying to get the teachers a raise. At the same time, we wanted to raise gas tax. The teachers need gas. They literally would have been paying for their own raise. Gas tax hurts poor people. Poor people need gas and they can't afford it. And if you raise taxes, you're, you're taxing poor people. 
So that's why they were blocking. They weren't blocking it because they're stubborn. They're blocking it because we need revenue raising measures in Oklahoma that don't hurt our poor people. That's all I had. Thanks. So in the bu budget negotiations, uh, the last deal that was given to Scott Inman was basically everything he wanted. Uh, and he walked away. It was an increase in income tax on uh, the upper level of Oklahomans. I think it's 200000 and up. If you made that, it increased their, their income tax. Uh, it was the five. Uh, There's a couple other things, and, and he walked away from that one. Uh, he could have taken that deal and walked out of the Capitol as a hero. Uh, but, uh, like I said, gross production tax wasn't going to fix the whole budget. We were going to have to fix it with other pieces of the puzzle. As far as your gas tax, we are six cents a gallon lower in gas taxes than our surrounding states. Uh, we have not raised gas tax since, I believe it's, man, it might have been in the 80s. It's been about 30 years since we've raised any gas tax in the state of Oklahoma. Now, on that gas tax, the, the thing that I wanted, if, and, I, and I told leadership this, if, if we raise gas tax, I want 100% of that money to go to fix our roads. Uh, I look at gas tax as a use tax. If you're putting gas in your car, you're driving on those roads. If you're putting diesel in that truck, you're driving on those roads, and that money should be to fix those roads. Uh, but uh, anyway. Um, I know that, oh, my name is Ashley Ortiz. Uh, also, I know that during the last year, whenever we were running for the uh, seat that you hold, we, you said that one of your biggest goals was to keep District 61 relevant mm -hmm. and that you were doing that. And can you tell me how in this legislative session you were able to do that? Oh, this session was ugly. And in my first campaign, I think I had stated it may not be what I get for District 61. It may be what I protect for District 61. And this year, I felt like I protected the conservation districts. I protected our extension program. Uh, this year, I had every bill of mine passed and sent to the governor besides one and I laid it over because I need to tweak it a little bit. I need to, I need to fix it, make it a little better. Um, with that being said, this year with all my bills passing and, and, and going to the governor and even that one I laid over passed the Senate and it would have went to the governor but I wanted to fix it before I sent it to the governor. I have a hard time feeling like this year was a win because with, with them taking $500 million away from wind, that was a big loss to me. Uh, I, this, I, I, this year, we just kind of stayed ground. I mean, we didn't, I don't, I just feel pretty beat up this year. Coble again. I just have one more question. You were talking earlier about win and then if we could manage to basically figure out a way to attract wind back into the area get the bad taste out of their mouth and possibly we could expand not just wind but other businesses that will come in because of the clean energy so then my question to you is what do we as voters as your constituents because we really can't control anything that happens in Tulsa mm -hmm. can't control anything that happens in Oklahoma City what can we do to help make that happen so what I've been looking at and what I've, I've visited with several people and and Mike Shannon knows this I think what we need to do as far as incentives is do it locally uh, with TIFs uh, and and provide those incentives locally uh, and I think I've I've talked to Mike and kind of rallied Mike burn that phone line up to the Senate I mean just call that Senate's office <coughs> redial uh, 
that's as far as what's happening down there but as far as locally i and i i really want to do tiffs and mike uh didn't the commissioners in texas county kind of start moving that direction mike shannon with predsy uh, yes they they moved in that uh direction but uh they were kind of hopeful for this session to be just a little bit better so i think you'll probably see a, a movement in that tax increment financing district uh, I, I'm hoping that's mm -hmm. where they're going to go after the session and if I can I've got one other little comment here I mean it's you know when at home when we we figure our budgets uh, we figure our budget first and somebody said there we're just backwards and you're right Josh I mean this whole thing is backwards is there a possibility and we've talked about this in the past that one session just be dedicated to the budget uh, then the next year a, a that's dedicated been, for appropriations and you're 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 not the only one it's been talked about a lot down there as as far as uh, getting that accomplished I don't know uh, yeah I'd like to get it all done you know as far as budget stuff done in March and then we work on policy and we're done because and I think as far as leadership goes in the in the three years that I've been there uh, that last week of session is tough you're you're tired you're beat up uh, and when you're tired and beat up you make poor decisions and I and, and you're talking about decisions on our budget I I think you know do it first off when we're fresh would be a great idea as far as how do we accomplish that I don't know I know it's been talked about a lot down there uh, but how we get it move that direction I don't know is there any questions burning in anybody's belly yes okay I don't actually have a question, but, oh, Katie Richards from Adams. I don't have a question, but I would like to thank you, Representative Murdoch, for giving me the opportunity to be a page this April. Um, it was a fun experience and I learned a lot, so thank you. You're, you're welcome and I enjoyed having you. And if, if you all have kids, and even if you don't have kids, if you know some kids that want to page, it's a tremendous experience. Uh, I, I wished I would have done it when I was in high school. Uh, you, you actually see what's going on and, and how uh, legislation is made, and, and more so than what you just see on TV. And I had thought that the schools push that and and they really don't I know I had a a page from Guyman last year and uh, she did it on her own and so uh, if you have kids if, if your school's not pushing it now in January I have my LA start calling schools and kind of reminding them if they will have some kids they want to send and kind of push it but uh, uh, go ahead and, and if you know some kids that would like to come uh, have them have, have them fill out the application now I'm only allowed for a session uh, since I've been there I have begged borrowed and stole three to four others so I'll, I'll have six to eight pages uh, a year but it's a it's a tremendous tremendous program um, the kids really learn a lot do we have any other questions it's almost work time. Sorry to, to I, do that to you. Oh, go ahead. I'm going to finish up with the bills that I did get passed. Uh, I wanted to get into questions, so you, you all would have plenty of time for your questions. But if we have a little time, I'll, I'll tell you some of the bills I passed this year. Uh, my audit bill passed, went to the Senate. Uh, that's the bill that got married into the Speaker and the Pro Tems bill. I, I think that's 
putting Oklahoma back on the right track as far as as saving money and, and getting us where we're spending your tax dollars as effectively as we can and efficiently. Uh, I had a hay baling bill which would allow the counties to contract uh, bailing up the right-of-ways. Uh, you know, the last few years we've had lots of rain and lots, there's a lot of hay in that bar, those bar ditches. And so I had a county commissioner from uh, Buffalo ask me to, to run this bill. So that bill got passed. Uh, the bill I laid over was, was my UAV bill, my drone bill. And what that would do is, is you, it would, um, you would have to have permission flying drones over uh, agriculture land. And, you know, to me, that's a private property and privacy issue. And uh, you, you have these people come from the city and just fly over your land, and, you know, especially after the fires that we had in the eastern part of my district. You know, you crash one of those drones out there and it gets hot and it starts a fire. Or, you know, they're, they're, I had, right at the end of session, I had a gentleman from Tulsa email me and they'd flown a drone over his backyard. His daughter was out there in the swimming pool and just sitting there with that drone over the swimming pool. He called the police and the police came and said, there's nothing we can do. There's no laws against doing that. Well, this, this bill would have uh, basically gave the, the sheriff's office and the police department the ability to write a speeding ticket uh, for illegal flight of drones if you don't have permission. And it's just respecting your neighbor. Uh, is is what that bill is about if i want to go fly a drone over tom's property i should ask his permission it's his property uh the other bills i've had i had blue lives matter uh it was a bill that if you kill a cop or if a person kills a cop you have you're gonna be put to death or life in prison without parole uh our police officers lay their lives on the line for e for us each and every day. And uh, they need to know that uh, we support them and that if something happens to them that their murderer is gonna be brought to justice. Um, I had a CAFO bill, confined feeding operation bill, which gave municipalities the ability to grant a waiver. So right now uh, there's a three mile, five, a three mile setback from building a confined feeding operation uh, from a, a municipality. And this bill allowed them to give the city to give a waiver if they wanted it. Uh, back to, in my mind, uh, local control. If a city wants it, it's up to the city. Um, another bill was, it was an alcohol bill. And what it did Jada should love this, for Chamber of Commerces and uh, economic developers, if they have an event to promote economic development uh, and they have a caterer that's licensed, they do not have to get a liquor license, which the caterer's licensed and it just, it saves Jada from having to go to Oklahoma City and get that license. For a five dollar a day license. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, <coughs> now I'm drawing a blank. So what? Uh, what are the odds you're? Uh, Hold on a second. You're going to be back in session again here. What do you think about that? I didn't get here in time. Uh, my name's David Watson. Do you want to ask again? I, I just asked the representative, what, what are the odds that you could potentially be back in session? In September? Yeah. It's up to the Supreme Court. So back to not being able to pass these revenue raising measures with a 76 vote, how we put this budget together was on 51 votes. And uh, back whenever I say we as a collective, we did a cigarette fee of $1.50 a pack on cigarettes. Now, I'm not a lawyer, 
and this was going to it's going to be lawyers fighting wordage out in the law but it's the cigarette fee that we put in was policy and it was a policy bill and these fees was to pay for policy now the law says any additional revenue that comes off of a fee goes into GR now I'm sure when they wrote that law they they were thinking okay you do this policy you do this policy and it's going to cost twenty thousand dollars and you put a fee on to raise twenty five twenty thousand dollars and you bring in twenty five thousand dollars well that five thousand dollars extra would just go into GR the cigarette tax the cigarette fee uh, dollar fifty a pack is going to bring in two hundred million dollars uh, Philip Morris has already filed a lawsuit to challenge that uh, it's going to be up to the courts now scuttlebutt uh, Drew Edmondson had said that is constitutional and it's it's fine and he was the Attorney General for the for the, for Oklahoma uh, he, he said no that's they're they're able to do that but it's it's going to be taken to the Supreme Court and they'll decide so uh, as far as my opinion I'm not a lawyer. Uh, the Supreme Court going to is going to rule on that. Back to your seven percent, and now I'm going to give you my opinion again. And everyone in here knows what opinions are like. Uh, if that should happen, in my opinion, we have to go back as a legislature. We have to go back and raise GPT, and we'll be called back into a special session for uh, revenue only. Anything else to add? I think that's it. Okay. I would like to invite each and every one of you to come out to a town hall meeting on Wednesday, uh, June the 7th, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Don't even know what today is. Second. Today's the second. So, um, <laughs> so go and, and to the pub on the bricks. We're going to have a Dutch treat lunch and. Um, Senator Marlatt will be there, and Representative Murdoch just told me a few minutes ago that he's, uh, he plans to attend as well. So if you have questions for the Senate side, please come out, and we will take the PTCI is going to be there filming as well, so we're going to have a great turnout. But uh, I'd like to thank Seaboard Foods for sponsoring breakfast today. It was really great, and Tracy for doing a great job on waiting the tables. And if you have anything other that you'd like to, to get a hold of Representative Murdoch, I think he has contact information on his website or mm -hmm. his uh, house page. And you can call him, email him, call his LA, and do whatever you need to do. So if we have nothing further, go work, go have a great day, and enjoy this beautiful weather. So thank you.